Welcome to Sound of the Goddess, a podcast for emerging devotional leaders dedicated to activating your authentic voice in your life and sacred work. I'm your host, Lisa Moria, shamanic priestess, somatic sound healer, storyteller, and sales and marketing coach. From priestesses to prophetesses to oracles, spiritual women in leadership have always served their most potent medicine right from their own mouths. Are they now calling you to speak freely? If so, join me for these eclectic conversations on unlocking your most courageous self-expression, healing your body with voice and drum, creating a living relationship with priestess ancestors, and growing your modern temple business, all anchored in the vibrational wisdom and real life stories of early Mesopotamian and biblical priestesses. Your voice is the most powerful mystery and medicine in the universe. Welcome once again, sister, to the holy lineage of women who have served as the sound of the goddess. And now, today's episode. Lai 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 I have all that I need and more I have all that I need and more Goddess knows just what's in store She's given me all that I need and more I have all that I need and more. I have all that I need and more. God knows just what's in store. He's given me all that I need and more. I have all that I need and more. I have all that I need and more. The one know just what's in store. The one has given me all that I need and more. Welcome back to the second episode of Sound of the Goddess with Lisa Moria. I am so delighted to have you with me today. And we have just been enjoying really two different pieces of sound healing, just short snippet to give you a taste. The lie, lie, lie at the beginning to the tune of the chant is a form of sound healing called nigun, which is common in very ecstatic Hasidic forms of Jewish mystical practice. And Nagun are wordless melodies where you sing a phrase of some kind um, or a, a sound of some kind to the tune. They're extremely powerful and beautiful nigunim, or that's the plural form. And uh, they are, there's a long history of these kinds of practices. Any of you who've been with me in gatherings and sacred ritual know that I will often use uh, nigun at the start. The second piece is the actual chant, which is a chant for the feeling of abundance with what we have in the present moment. And I reference goddess, I reference God, and I reference the one. Because as we will explore in this episode and many to come, the most powerful voices that we have, voices of the goddess, sounds of the goddess, come from early women who who lived and ritualized and served in cultures where there was a nascent understanding of the one source of all life. God and goddess were seen as aspects of this one source that were in complete unity. And we see echoes of this later in the Jewish mystical teachings around Adonai and Shekhinah, the divine masculine, divine feminine aspects of the one. Aspect may not be the best term, but you know, so for any of you out there who are technical about this, forgive me, but it's, I, I think, one of the more accessible ways to explore that idea. So the chant really acknowledges God, goddess, and the one, which is the unity of these polarities and the fact that they are in union and they are a spectrum and that they also appear 
on the surface to be dual in the in the in the material world that we live in but they really are one so i hope you've enjoyed that and today let's dive right in our topic is the very first voices very first women's voices powerful voices where do we meet them where do we find them where is the origin point of powerful women's voices and i want to say first off what i'm about to share today these are not the first women to ever use their voices on the planet but they are the first ones we have record of so for us they are the origin point of our knowing at this time in history that this podcast is being recorded so uh, it is, and it's a real privilege for me to speak about these women because for me, they are not just historical record. They are living ancestral presences who are available for guidance and support. And when they come into our consciousness, when they float into our field of awareness through books or tools like this podcast, through art, through things we may scroll or see on the internet, very often they are attempting to connect with us, to link us into their lineage of holy women who have been the sound of the goddess and to activate within us our own powerful voices. So I see them as allies in the task of reclaiming, of owning, of amplifying our powerful voices in the world. And, you know, very often when we talk about women's voices, there is a tendency to resort to statements like, uh, well, the patriarchy has suppressed women's voices or, um, you know, in a world of men, women need to take back the power of their voice. I've seen advertisements recently for a very popular vocal healing program that use this kind of rhetoric. And, you know, it is a perspective and, you know, you may share that perspective. I would like to offer an alternative perspective. I do not believe in the perpetuating the sense of separation and wounding between the masculine and the feminine. Um, Part of the reason why that chant incorporates both God and goddess and why it references the one and why I used it today is precisely for this very point. There has been deep wounding on this planet from low wounded forms of patriarchy that have been enacted that have served neither men nor women. Uh, nor any human beings or any creatures. And these aspects, this form of patriarchy, and we tend to call it the patriarchy, but in doing so, we, we disavow, we ignore, or we cover over the fact that this is also wounded lower behavior. This is not the masculine in its highest essence and form, in its wisest, best, greatest, most containing, most gentle most uh, gentle and gently holding and supporting capacity. So I would like to think that a patriarchy founded on the highest masculine would be a beautiful thing in the world, just as matriarchal practices that are, are practiced from the highest femininity uh, are also beautiful, healing, and good. But, you know, if we are going to say, well, the matriarchy is going to take over the patriarchy and everything's going to be fine now, we need to look and see whether the matriarchy that is coming in is really the form of matriarchy that's in resistance to the patriarchy, which is also wounded lower femininity. So we need to really be clear about what, you know, whether we're talking about the basement or the balcony version of <laughs> these energies. And I bring this up to say that I do not find it particularly productive to theorize reclaiming my authentic voice in myself and in the world as a process of thumbing my nose at the patriarchy or taking back my power from men. This is not how I see it. Actually, my experience has been in life that my reclaiming my voice really heals my relationship with men because the masculine in its highest essence, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is wired to serve the feminine and wants to know what the feminine wants. And very often the lower or wounded feminine um, that believes men, you know, don't care or don't want to be supportive or has had the kind of men who do uh, not listen to what you have to say or dis- you know, ignore your requests or your statements about what you need or desire. Like that has been their only experience with the masculine. And so the assumption is, well, I need to take back my voice so I can get this to the exclusion of men or 
apart from men or in opposition to men, masculinity, or the patriarchy. And for me, reclaiming my voice as a sovereign human being is allowing me to become in greater unity with the highest form of those energies, both in myself and in the world around me. So I become closer to the highest form of my own femininity when I reclaim my voice. I also, you know, activate the masculine within me. Um, that's another conversation we'll have on another day, how your voice is part of that process of where, you know, your own masculine is integrated. And it also allows me to express myself clearly with boundaries, but also in the deepest essence of my desire to the men in my life who desire to actually, um, bring those desires to pass and be part of serving me in that way. So going back for me, going back to the earliest women, um, writers and creatives that we're going to look at today and these earliest voices is not a process of thumbing my nose at the patriarchy or saying F the patriarchy. Um, it really is about imagining a time where women may have experienced more wholeness in terms of their presence in society. We don't know for sure, but certainly there were powerful women uh, you know, in those times. And those are some of the voices that are left for us. And seeing that for itself and it's on its own terms, not seeing it as an act for or against men or the patriarchy, but as um, going back and listening to these women for their own sake and, uh, you know, experiencing the reclamation of these energies from a space of greater wholeness, from the origin point. Because there's something beautiful and fresh about origin points. You'll hear me talk about origins a lot. Much of my work of giving voice to the biblical goddess, a biblical goddess says, there's many aspects of goddess that are found in the biblical writings, um, giving voice to Mesopotamian goddesses, um, being the voice of goddess myself, learning how to become that you know, in the world as an oracle. A lot of that has been about going back to this origin point energy. So without further ado... Who are these women, these earliest women whose voices we have record of? And really, the first thing to point out is that the earliest voices, period, from any gender identity are women's. Um, the earliest known writer from 4,000 years ago was a woman named Anaduana. She was a high priestess of the moon god Nana or Sin, as he was known in Assyria, um, at Ur, which was his main temple, she was the daughter of a very powerful uh, Sumerian king. Um, and I won't get into all the details of her history. We'll have another episode that's just devoted to her another day. But suffice to say, she was politically and religiously powerful because, of course, religion and the state were intertwined. Um, Anaduana was ritually in her role as the high priestess of this powerful moon god. She was the representative or the embodiment on earth of his wife. So she embodied the goddess Ningal, who was Nana's wife. Ningal is a goddess of vegetation, goddess of the reeds. So really, Anaduana's role was to be the embodiment of fertility and the land. Um, and then she would have engaged in sacred sexual rituals uh, yearly. Uh, whether those were like literally sexual or whether they were, um, y you know, there were like other stand in rituals, we don't know for sure. <clears throat> but her role would have been to help the king ensure the fertility of the land, basically, um, and ensure the fertility of the people, the animal, the crops, the cattle. This was a fundamental tenet of Mesopotamian religion for obvious reasons, right? Fertility is how things are perpetuated. You need fertile fertile lands, you need fertile animals, you need to be fertile yourself to raise children who will help you to um, grow and maintain your legacy in the world. So this is very important to these early peoples. And um, Anaduana, uh, we have her name written on an alabaster moon-shaped disc, which seems to speak about her installation into this office of high priestess. At one point, she lost the office, by the way, due to an interloper on the throne and later reclaimed it. Um, but she left us a library's worth of poetry, both poems about all the major temples to various gods and goddesses across Sumer, which, by the way, is in modern-day Iraq, if you're needing a reference for where that is, that general area coming down into the Gulf 
um, stretching over, you know, the influence of the Sumerians stretched all the way over into Turkey and the Levant. So we're talking the 2000s BCE, uh, maybe a few hundred years before the prophet and patriarch Avraham, who is the thought of as the founder of the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, this would have been a few hundred years before he was born. He and his wife, Sarah, who I believe was a priestess also of Nana. So she may have been part of the group that Enaduana helped to found and nurture. But anyway, Anna Duana left us this record of poetry, and um, she left us. She's the first recorded writer in history, also a priestess. And she left us this bank of poems, temple poems, amazing poems about the various temples to the various gods and goddesses in Sumer. And she also left us a corpus of poetry of her own personal devotion to the goddess Inanna, because while Anna Duana ritually embodied the goddess Ningal, um, in her work at Ur, she personally was devoted, deeply devoted to Inanna, who was thought of in the Sumerian pantheon as Nana's daughter. You may be familiar with Inanna. She's probably one of the most famous um, famous goddesses from the Mesopotamian pantheon. If you've done any work with the Rose lineage, um, that type of priestessing, you, you know, Inanna is you know, considered part of that lineage. And uh, Ishtar, the goddess Ishtar, is another name for Inanna in a slightly different Akkadian Assyrian lineage versus Sumerian. So, and Duana left these amazing poems, and it's possible she didn't write them, it's possible she compiled them, we don't know for sure, but likely the writers were still women because there were a lot of priestesses serving in temples at this time. We know that in these early temples, uh, which were often called, you know, ziggurats or were on top of ziggurats, which were the sort of <clears throat> combination of like a pyramid and a Mayan, you know, Mayan temple style build, um, but with a Sumerian twist, look them up. You'll see it's a very distinctive style of building if you're not familiar with the ziggurat. Um, but, you know, she, these, these, these ziggurats the, in, in the temples that they contained, many of them were populated by priestesses who were highly educated, highly trained. They were the doctors and dentists of their time. They were the writers. They were the scribes. Um, we know of many later priestesses in Mesopotamia who were employed as scribes. I believe some in Egypt as well, uh, if we're going to get over into that lineage. So <clears throat> lots of, uh, lots of, of professions that today we, we see women reentering and, you know, stepping back into in a big way. Uh, many of them, you know, women may have been the original practitioners, women in temples, priestesses, women who were thought of highly because of their specialized training, <clears throat> were probably also the first people to hold those specialized roles and writer being one of them. And I cannot tell you what it did for me personally when I learned that the first recorded writer in history was a woman and a priestess and a Mesopotamian at that because I'm very deeply connected to this lineage. Myself, I do a lot of work with Sin or Nana that is the same god that Anna Duana uh, ritually served in her office as high priestess. I do a lot of work in the complex of his old temple at Haran in southeastern Turkey. Um, and uh, so I'm, you know, and, and I feel very, very connected to her. She's been an ancestral guide for me, has been very lovingly present in my life and continues to be lovingly present. I hope she always will be. But even just learning about her as a historical person, back at a time in my life when I did not have the capacity to imagine ancestors as presences yet in my life, um, that they were loving, that they were living, that they wanted to be present and they were, they were connecting and communicating with me for a reason. Before I even understood that, I could appreciate her as a historical figure who helped me to see the origins of my craft and of a voice. Her powerful voice was what started to give me permission to really unlock my creative voice and my own power as a woman, my ritual power, my power as a drummer, which is something we're going to get into in our next episode. We're going to have a drum episode, which I'm very excited about. Uh, all of these things I learned, you know, women as um, 
as a guardian of land and as a conduit of fertility of land. Like all of these things were things I picked up initially. The vibrational frequency came through, through reading the words of Enaduana. And the vibration of her poetry is very powerful. You know, 4,000 years later, that poetry is still touching lives. It's still speaking. The vibrations of the divine aspects that she knew and loved and wrote about and ritualized about come through in those poems. And you might say, well, how do we have these poems? Like, how is this different from biblical record or any of these other old texts that we have? Well, it's very different for one startling reason, and that is we do not have the original composed manuscripts of many ancient texts like the biblical record. So the books of the Old Testament, so-called, and New Testament, so-called, the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Testament, if we're going to be a little more accurate. Um, We don't have the original manuscripts of those. We have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And they're still powerful documents. There's still a sacred record. They actually, even though that book is crafted in many ways, especially the Hebrew Bible is crafted to overturn goddess worship in favor of a certain kind of monotheism. It's a very distinctly crafted document that's designed to do that once you see what it's doing, even though it's not usually presented that way. Um, it still leaves us a powerful record of goddess, right? These are very valuable and useful documents, but we do not have the original manuscripts or original manuscripts from a library that's very close to the original date of execution. We do with Enna Duana's poetry because when excavations in the early 20th century, when excavations began to happen at Ur, at these other sites in Iraq, uncovering the ziggurats and the cities of of Mesopotamia, of Sumer. And some archaeologists have said that the finds were so valuable, the treasures were so vast in those archaeological digs that one archaeologist, who I cannot remember his name, but I'll never forget the quote, he said, if you saw what came out of Mesopotamia, you wouldn't even care about Egypt anymore because what came out of Mesopotamia was so much richer and more vast and more powerful. But a lot of it was looted. A lot of it was lost. There have been wars in that region. You know, that's another conversation, another another episode. But we were fortunate in what we did find to have vast libraries of clay tablets, which clay will last virtually forever when it's been fired properly and it's it's actually buried in sand in the way that it is in the the environment of Iraq, the desert, it preserves. And these clay tablets, we have vast libraries of them, and these libraries have copies of the same materials. So, for example, if one tablet or a piece of a tablet is broken or missing from one library, sometimes the remainder of what was on that tablet will be corroborated by something in another library. And these clay tablets were written on with styluses made out of reed, since there's a lot of marshland in Mesopotamia, or was at that time anyway. Um, And uh, the writing is called cuneiform. It's a very specific wedge-shaped looking, like almost, it looks kind of a little bit like Japanese, but with wedges. Um, And it's not quite character-based in the same way as Japanese. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a comparison you can make there. I'm not an expert in ancient Sumerian language. I wish I was. Maybe someday I will be. But so I'm not going to go there because I don't want to misspeak on that parallel. But it to the untrained eye, you know, it's it's very pictorial in its its impression, initial impression. And so we found library after library with collections of Enna Duana's poems. And as again, if one tablet was broken or damaged, another library might help to support or corroborate, you know, what was being found. And um, there are other women who are mentioned who are drummers, uh, women who are priestess wives of kings. So they may not have been the main wife, they might not have been the queen of the country, but oftentimes in terms of their 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 influence in matters of state and their actual interaction with the king, they were more powerful than the queen or the official wife of the king. There are so many of these women. And the fact that Enna Duana was able to write and compile all of these poems in these various collections and that they were preserved and populated, you know, throughout these various libraries suggests that she was an important and known writer. 
and that it was not unusual for women to be an important and known writer. And so you might be asking, well, what does this have to do with me today? I want you, if you're a woman listening to this podcast, I want you to stop and think about the fact that, you know, I mean, think about all the writers that we can name that are famous in history. Many of them are men. Um, and uh, sometimes there were women writing under men's names or things like that. But when we go all the way back to the origin point of our knowledge base for civilization, we find a powerful woman who is a ritual leader. She's a devotional leader in a religious cult that was very important, that was both politically and religiously significant. It was a very high-profile role. And she's writing. Her voice is going out into the world. Her voice. And her, her voice speaks to us 4,000 years later. We dig her up out of the sand and she speaks again. And I want you to imagine now, 4,000 years in the future, would what you have to say matter? I believe it would. I believe there's something in you that has that kind of lasting staying power. There is something in you that is meant to leave a legacy in your voice of what you have to say. It's meant to leave a legacy on this planet. And sometimes it takes us leaning in to these figures, to these characters, to these individuals like Enna Duana, and not only just leaning into them, as I said earlier, as historical figures. Oh, that's nice. That's interesting. Oh, I should read Enna Duana's poetry. By the way, the best uh, writer I can recommend if you want to read about Enna Duana is um, Betty Deshong Metter. Um, and the, it's Betty, uh, B-E-T-T-Y, Deshong, D-E-S-H-O-N-G, and then Metter, M-E-A-D-O-R. She's written several books on Enna Duana and done amazing translations of Anna Duana's writings, both her work on on um, Anna Duana's uh, collection of poetry for the goddess Inanna, which will just make you cry. It's so beautiful. Um, and then the temple hymns poetry, which is a little a little more challenging to wade through, but Metter's writing about it like really brings all of Mesopotamia, all of Sumer alive, like helps you to really dig into the culture through those poems, which is super valuable as well if you're interested in this topic. So, um, but you know, you, ha- you come. If you say, well, I don't have a voice. None of the women in my line have ever had a voice. My mother couldn't ask for what she wanted. My grandmother lived in quiet desperation. You know, the women of my line were, you know, went behind closed doors and cried about what they didn't receive from men or from, you know, from the world or from other women, but they c- couldn't ask for it. You know, we've never been women of powerful voice. I mean, maybe you do come from a line of women with powerful voices, but if you don't and you're listening to this, or maybe it's 50-50 in your lineage, You also come from the line of Enaduana. Most women listening to this podcast have a devotional core. Well, all women have a devotional core. That's another conversation for another day. Also, how many conversations have I referenced that we need to have on another day? But some of us are called to live our devotion as our, our, our work in the world in a public way. Like when I go to Haran and I work on the land, I do energy work on the land. I also do some ritual work in the area around what would have likely been Nana's temple, so the moon god's temple. I do my best, you know, as I understand it. I'm studying and growing more in this every day to embody the ritual wife of Nana in that work, to take up that role, essentially. And I have Enaduana to look at as my model for how to do that. I mean, you know, I'm not expecting anyone to acknowledge that I am that. I'm not expecting anyone to give me honor or to um, pat me on the back for being that. That's something I've taken on myself because, I mean, who else is there to do it at this time? So, uh, but I'm able to do that because I can look back at Enaduana and say, I'm part of her line. She's come to me. Her consciousness has reached out to me through thousands of years, through the writing. Her consciousness was part of what drew me to southeastern Turkey, to Haran, which was another major cult center of Nana. Um, it's difficult to get into Iraq, to go to the to, to Ur, which is the main site. But, um, you know, I was drawn to Haran. And also, you know, I spend part of my time in Sinai, 
in uh, in Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. The original name, many scholars feel, comes from of Sin, which is the other name of Nana, of the moon god. So the god that Anaduana was devoted to as the ritual wife. Um, and the worship of the moon god was very prevalent here, especially in South Sinai, which is where I live when I come here. You know, and so I'm, I, I giggle sometimes, you know, that Anaduana and her energy and the energy of, of, you know, Nana or seeing that particular aspect of the divine, like is very insistent on bringing me back to this place. Um, so, you know, there's real life guidance and real life power and activation of voice. Even me being here in this podcast today, speaking about these topics, transmitting this wisdom to you, which I hope you will then turn around and transmit to someone else. Like that is possible. I am giving voice to Anaduana as an ancestor and that giving voice is only possible because of the work that she has done as an ancestral presence and that, you know, meeting these different women from this Mesopotamian lineage who were powerful priestesses, writers, creatives, drummers, singers, artists, women who had voice. I don't have to look at my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, although I love them all very much, but I don't have to look at them as the sum total of what's possible for me with my voice. I can go all the way back to the beginning to a time period that I feel very aligned with and look at the women then and say, wow, these are my mothers. These are the mothers of my devotional leadership. These are the mothers of my craft. These are the mothers of my business. These are the mothers of my beingness in the world, how I embody. And their voices are guiding me. And they're turning around and activating my voice to speak up and to speak freely. So I hope this has been enlightening for you. I hope you'll go and research more about Anaduana. Um, I do teach about her quite a bit in my priestess initiation course called Tent Keepers, which is guided by the ancestral consciousness of the Hebrew matriarchs, the first biblical matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, which you may know as Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. They were, I believe, Mesopotamian priestesses of the same or very similar lineage as Inanna. There is tremendous evidence of this in the stories in the biblical book of Genesis. We're not used to that because it's not taught that way. We're never taught that these women were priestesses or that they were you know, servants of the old gods or goddesses, but they were, I believe, and there's a lot of evidence for this. Um, and actually even seen Nan- uh, Nana the moon god and uh, his priestesses are, you know, very present in that text. So I teach on this um, as part of the activation and initiation of tent keepers, which is a mix of teaching and ritual. Um, and I joke that it's incredibly powerful because, you know, after I taught that class and did everything in that, you know, I, I led all the rituals, I did all the work, basically, um, I ended up in Haran and ended up um, really being guided, you know, to the physical lands that I had been teaching about. And there was deeper activation waiting for me there. I was ushered into a very powerful uh, traveling season after I finished teaching that course. So if you're interested in more on that and just on activating and awakening your creativity, there is a relationship between your voice and your vulva, your voice and your yoni, your voice and your womb. And that's another thing we specifically work on activating in Tent Keepers, that relationship between fertility and your creative expression is huge. Your voice is such a key in being able to birth anything that you desire to birth, projects, a life, manifestations, love, all of these things. So um, you can find that at schooldivineradiance.com if you are interested in that. And I am, this year, will be probably releasing some other offerings that go deeper specifically into the priestess lineages of Mesopotamia and into the ancestral consciousnesses and women around that. So watch for more later this year. If you stay tuned to this podcast, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that as we go along. So thank you so much for joining me. I want you to remember that your voice is your power. Uh, That power 
is not just disconnected, alone, freestanding in the world, and it is not connected to any of the results that your women of your biological lineage may or may not have been able to get with their voices. Um, it is really connected if you choose to be connected to this early lineage of women who are powerful, powerful communicators, writers, speakers, poets, leaders, ritualizers, um, priestesses, you tap into that power. Their power, their voice, speaking 4,000 years into the future, is the power that also flows through your vocal cords. And how might that change how you express yourself today? I hope you'll go forward and find out. This has been an episode of Sound of the Goddess, a podcast with Lisa Moria. I would be delighted to connect with you, hear your story, and receive your feedback. You can find me on my website at lisamoria.com. That's L-I-S-A-M-O-R-I-A-H.com. On Instagram at Lisa Moria Speaks. And on YouTube also at Lisa Moria Speaks. If you're interested in courses, coaching, or workshops, you can find everything that's currently available at schoolofdivineradiance.com. And of course, you can always reach out to me via email as well at lisamoriaspeaks at gmail.com. And I look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Sound of the Goddess.